Next speaker is Honourable Judge Graeburn of the County Court of the Judicial District of York, the topic election and re-election. Several years ago, I had the pleasure of introducing Judge Graeburn and had a two or three page curriculum vitae. Somehow over the last several years, His Honour Judge Graeburn has become somewhat more modest and there is a very, very brief background provided to us. He was called to the bar in 1950 in private practice from 1950 until 1956. He appointed assistant crown attorney of this county in 1956. Deputy crown attorney in 1967 was crown attorney for the county of York 1968 through 1970. He was appointed to the county court in 1970 I think a few years ago I commented that for the first few years, members of the defense bar thought his honor was still a member of the Crown Attorney staff. But all that changed rather dramatically shortly thereafter. And I think that his honor's reputation as a trial judge is such that he is likely the least appealable trial judge in the province of Ontario. And whether it is Crown appeal or defense appeal, the likelihood of success before the Court of Appeal against a trial judgment of His Honours is most unlikely. His Honour Judge Graeburn. Thank you very much, Brian. The subject that was assigned to me uh, really isn't the most stimulating subject in the world. I don't know how you get people terribly interested in elections and re-elections, and when I was assigned the subject, I thought maybe I could start off by telling a little story I'd heard regarding elections, but I thought I'd have a trial balloon before I told it to you, and I told it to Mike Moldaver just before the lecture started tonight, and he still doesn't understand the point. So, and I think he'd like me to try it out again on you and see if you people think it's funny. Many, many years ago, and this would be in the early 50s when I first started to practice law, I was over in the old courthouse and this unrepresented accused was appearing before the magistrate, as he was then called, and the magistrate gave him his election in the terms of the old criminal code. Now, I'm really too old now to remember what the election was under the old criminal code, and too many years have passed by since I've heard that election, but it went something like this. You have the option to elect to be tried by a magistrate forthwith, or you have the option to elect to be tried by the next court of competent jurisdiction, or words to that effect. So the learned magistrate gave the election to the unrepresented accused, and after he had done it, the accused looked up at him and said, which do you think is best? <laughs> You're much more understanding than Mr. Moldaver. Uh, in my paper, and tonight I'm tried to update uh, the law in relation to elections and re-elections over the past five years, and I'd like to divide it up, if I can, into five categories. First, I'd like to talk about the case of Zipt and other cases, or at least one other case, that's arisen from the case of Zipt. I'd like to talk about procedure, failure to put an election, re-election, and the form of re-election. The most important case, obviously, which uh, has been decided in the last five years is the judgment of the Supreme Court of Canada in Zipt which is now in a bound volume of the CCC's 58 CCC second at page 204. In the Zipt case, which came from the province of Ontario, the accused had elected trial by judge and jury, and when he made his election for trial by judge and jury, he specified that he wished that trial to take place in the Supreme Court of Ontario. This was in relation to an offense which was not contained in Section 427. The provincial court judge refused to accept the election. Mandamus followed, 
and the application for mandamus was dismissed at every level of court right through to the Supreme Court of Canada. In the Supreme Court of Canada, it was held that where an accused has a right of election, he may choose his mode of trial, but he may not choose the forum. In other words, apart from Section 427, where the offenses therein specified must be tried in the Supreme Court, and subject to something I'm going to say a little later about Section 429.1, where there appears to be an option, appears to be an option, an accused may be tried in the Supreme Court of Ontario or in the county court. Apart from that, an accused may opt for a jury trial, or he may opt for a trial by a judge without a jury, but he cannot choose the forum in which he wishes to be tried. Of course, as a practical matter, in relation to the provincial court judge, obviously, in the ordinary way, he will be able to choose his forum in that regard, subject, of course, to the Attorney General's right to demand a jury trial under Section 498 if the circumstances are uh, applicable. As a result of ZIPT, which of course was concerned with a jury trial, if an accused elects under Section 484 for trial by a judge without a jury, it is my view that he cannot specify the forum in which he wishes to be tried, and only the Crown can do that. And my reasons for com coming to that conclusion is based upon what was the precise issue in the Zipped case, where Chief Justice Laskin, after setting out the question of the uh, judge and jury, then went on to say, in short, in electing trial by a court composed of a judge and jury, is he, that is to say the accused, entitled to claim trial before a court composed of a Supreme Court judge and jury, and as you know, in Zip they said no, correlatively, should he elect trial by judge alone, is he entitled to specify trial by a Supreme Court judge alone? And in my view, analogizing to the holding of the court in Zipped regarding a jury trial, the same rules would apply in reference to an election for a non-jury trial or a trial before a judge alone. Further, if an accused, and this also arises out of the Zipped case, supposing an accused is indicted in the Supreme Court of Ontario by the Crown for a trial by judge and jury. And then the accused wishes to re-elect for trial by a judge alone. In my view, it follows from the Zipped case and also from an even more recent case, which I'll discuss with you in a moment, that the accused will again be unable to select his forum as between the county and the Supreme Court, that the forum is completely in the hands of the Crown and the accused has no right to select his forum on re-election in circumstances as I've just mentioned. I take that view because in Zipped, one of the cases which was referred to by the Supreme Court of Canada was a judgment of my own in a case called Jory, J-O-R-Y, which was decided back in 1978 and is reported in 46 Canadian Criminal Cases, second series at page 44. In that case, there were multiple accused. They had been indicted in the Supreme Court of Ontario by the Crown. One of the accused appeared before me and wished to re-elect to be tried by a judge without a jury. I held that he had the right to elect before me for trial by a judge without a jury, but that in the circumstances, while I would 
If he did endeavor to reelect before me, I would invoke section 497, subsection D of the criminal code and require that the accused be tried together with his co-accused in the Supreme Court for a trial by judge and jury. Now, in that regard, Chief Justice Laskin said, after setting out uh, what I had done, he said that it is true that Judge Graburn said he would invoke Section 497D if the accused should re-elect trial by judge alone in the county court judge's criminal court, and that he would then require him to be tried with his co-accused in the Supreme Court with a jury. I do not, however, regard these observations as considered conclusions that would lend support to the appellant's contention. Uh, when modesty has been mentioned a little earlier, this is one of the reasons why I'm modest. They are perhaps a reflection of the course of practice in such situations. The main question for Judge Graburn was whether the accused could re-elect before him. His observations about re-election for trial by judge alone in the county court judge's criminal court are not supported by section 492 subsection 3, nor does his invocation of section 497D allow him to specify trial in the Supreme Court with a jury. Section 492.3 speaks only of re-election for trial before a judge alone without specification of the forum, and Section 497D speaks of discretion to require a trial by a court composed of a judge and jury, again, without specification of the forum. The latest word on the matter, and I just received this in my office this afternoon, although Mr. Doherty was kind enough to send me the unreported judgment of Mr. Justice Toy in the case of Ishmael, which is now reported in 20, I'm sorry, in 22 Criminal Reports, third series, at uh, page 81, uh, Mr. Justice Toy of the British Columbia Supreme Court has held that in circumstances similar to that which took place in the jury case, the accused has no right to specify his forum on re-election before judge alone, and that only the Crown can specify that forum. Mr. Justice Toy, interestingly enough, also held in the Ishmael case, which I commend very much to you, that the accused couldn't re-elect twice. In the, in the Ishmael case, what the accused had tried to do after he had, uh, had his trial originally was supposed to be before judge and jury in the Supreme Court of British Columbia, he then purported to re-elect for a trial in that particular case, first time, I, I may have this reversed, he either re-elected to be tried in county court judge's criminal court, or he re-elected, no, that's, yes, he did, to, he re-elected to be tried in county court judge's criminal court, and then being somewhat concerned about the, about the validity of the election, he then filed a notice indicating he wished to re-elect before a judge alone in the Supreme Court of British Columbia. And Mr. Justice Toy said that he could not uh, re-elect twice for two reasons. Number one, there's no provisions in the criminal code for it, and number two, you can't choose the forum in which you wish to be tried. So I think that that is the situation now arising out of Zipt and also arising out of Mr. Justice Toy's judgment, Ishmael. And I'd like to go on now with the question of procedure on elections. The, in the ordinary way where an accused is charged with an indictable offense, other than offense under section 427 of the criminal code or an offense over which a uh, magistrate has absolute jurisdiction under section 483, the accused is to be given an election as to the mode of trial under section 484. However, that is not an absolute right. When the Crown prefers an indictment under section 505 subsection 4 of the criminal code or under section 507 subsection 3 of the criminal code, 
the accused has no right of election or re-election, even with the consent of the Crown, and the trial must be held before a judge and jury in accordance with Section 429 of the Criminal Code. And the two authorities for that are Welch and Unitsi, a judgment of, um, of his honor, Judge uh, Vanini, in 31 Canadian Criminal Cases, Second Series, page 329, and also, so far as Section 507 is concerned, a judgment of the Saskatchewan District Court in Bolt, 35 Canadian Criminal Cases, Second Series, at page 127. The reasoning behind the two judgments is that the indictment itself is the foundation of the prosecution. Something which happens frequently, or I shouldn't say necessarily frequently, but has been happening with more frequency in the last few years, is what happens where the accused, or co-accused, are before the provincial court judge and they opt to elect for different modes of trial. In the case of Antonation and the Queen, which is in 35 Canadian criminal cases, second series at page 426, a judgment of the British Columbia uh, Supreme Court, there were three co-accused. At the preliminary hearing, one accused elected trial by judge alone, while the other two accused elected trial by judge and jury. At that point, the Crown asked the provincial court judge to use his discretion under section 497 subsection A and order that all the accused be tried together before a judge and a jury. The court held that the discretion under section 497 was available only to a judge or magistrate vested with jurisdiction to hold the trial. And therefore, in that case, the provincial court judge holding a preliminary inquiry had no such jurisdiction and consequently no discretion under section 497. And the court went on and held that the word judge in section 497 subsection A of the code referred to a judge of the county or the Supreme Court and so for that reason also the provincial court judge had no discretion under section 497A. If you have the situation where one accused elects trial by a provincial court judge under section 484 and the other accused elect some other mode of trial at the same time, either trial by judge and jury or trial by judge alone, it seems that there, in that situation, section 497, subsection B, confers a discretion on the provincial court judge as to whether to accept the election or not. I'd like to move along now to whether or not there is a duty on the part of the court to inquire into the accused's understanding of the ramifications of his election or re-election when the accused is represented. And I think that the answer to that question is no. If an accused is represented, there is no duty on the court to inquire into the accused's understanding of the ramifications of his election, but that there is a duty if the accused is not represented. In the case of Davis, which is a judgment of the Alberta Court of Appeal and reported in 35 Canadian criminal cases, second series of 464, the accused who was 16 years old and represented by counsel re-elected under section 430 of the criminal code to be tried by a judge alone on a charge of murder. Well, as you know, that section is only applicable to the province of Alberta. And the court held that even in such a serious case as murder, that there was no duty upon the court to inquire into the accused's understanding of his election, and that to hold otherwise would usurp the role of counsel and could possibly result in an infringement 
upon the privilege between the accused and his counsel. However, the court went on to say that if the accused is unrepresented, there may well be a duty upon the court to make sure that the accused understands the consequences of his election. And even though Section 430 is applicable only to the province of Alberta in relation to re-elections for trial by judge alone on charges of murder, it would seem to me that that principle should properly apply to all other sections involving elections and re-elections. There has not been a great deal of case law in relation to Section 429.1 of the Criminal Code. And you remember that in 429.1 of the Criminal Code, the charges which are mentioned uh, amongst others are rape, manslaughter, attempted murder, etc. In the ordinary way, if an accused elects under that section to be tried by a judge and a jury, the trial will be in the Supreme Court of Ontario in the ordinary way. But the accused is permitted under subsection 3, I believe it is, of section 429.1 to elect trial by a court which is not a superior court of criminal jurisdiction, which of course would include the county court. If an accused elects pursuant to section 429.1 to have his trial in the county court, that does not confer upon him a vested right so to have it, and the Crown may still indict the accused in the Supreme Court of Ontario. Now, the case which decides that is a case called Batte, or BT, it's difficult to know how to pronounce it, B-A-T-T-E-A-Y and others, which was decided in 1979, 50 Canadian criminal cases, second series, page 400, a judgment of Mr. Justice O'Driscoll. The reasoning in the Batty case is very similar to the reasoning of the Supreme Court of Canada in Zip. In the Batty case, it was held that, first of all, where the Crown prefers an indictment pursuant to Section 507, then, of course, the Crown can require that the trial be held before a Supreme Court judge and jury. The effect of the accused consenting under Section 429.1D, I'm sorry, it is not C, to a trial by a county court judge and jury is not to give him a vested right to have his trial in the county court, but was to enlarge the Crown's choices for the forum of trial. That is to say, if the accused doesn't consent to a trial by county court judge and jury, then the Crown must proceed to trial before a Supreme Court judge and a jury in the ordinary way. However, if the accused does consent then the Crown has the choice of having the trial before a Supreme Court judge and jury or a county court judge and jury. So that's the reason why I said at the outset that what would appear to be uh, a choice on the part of the accused under 429.1 is in fact not really a choice in the long run. An interesting variation of the Zipt and the Battier or Batty cases is to be found in a case called Glenn, which is reported in 14 Criminal Reports, third series, page 189, a judgment of the Ontario District Court. Where the accused is charged with an offense within section 429.1, and elects trial by judge and jury, and does not consent to be tried by a county court judge and jury, he cannot be forced to have the trial in the county court, even though the offense on which he is committed for trial is not an offense within section 429.1. And in the Glenn case, the reasoning for this 
turns upon the meaning of the word charged in section 429.1 of the criminal code. In Glenn, Zana Judge Luca Dalis held that the word charged in section 429.1 referred to the charge laid by the police and not the charge upon which the accused is committed for trial. Therefore, an election under section 464 or section 484 for trial by judge and jury on a section 429.1 offense means a superior court judge and jury unless the accused otherwise consents. And this is so even if the offense upon which the accused is committed for trial is not within section 429.1 and therefore would not ordinarily be tried by the Supreme Court. So the result of these cases is rather anomalous. Where a non-429-1 offense is involved, ordinarily the Crown can select the forum. Where a 429.1 offense is involved, the Crown can still select the forum, notwithstanding the accused's agreement to be tried in the county court. But if the accused is committed for trial on a non-429-1 offense, but was originally charged with a 429-1 offense, he is entitled to his trial in the Supreme Court. And that, in my view, is the result of the cases which I have discussed with you. I'm moving now to the failure to put the election to the accused in the case of Lewis, which was decided in 1978 and is reported in 43 Canadian criminal cases, second series at page 479, the Ontario Court of Appeal held that failure to put the election to the accused pursuant to section 484 will deprive the court of jurisdiction. And that is so even when the accused pleads guilty before a provincial court judge because the provincial court judge will have no jurisdiction to accept the plea. Well, the question then becomes, and this has been the result of a fair amount of litigation over the past few years, when must the accused be put to his election? The case which gives rise to problems in that area is the case of Doyle, which was decided back in 1976 by the Supreme Court of Canada, and you'll have the citation uh, in the paper, and particularly the remarks of Mr. Justice Ritchie, where amongst other things he stated, the failure to put the accused to his election as required by the code was a clear error which of itself involved the loss of jurisdiction over the accused. Now that statement combined with his remarks in the Doyle case that he disagreed with the view expressed in the Newfoundland Court of Appeal which had held that section 484 subsection 2 does not require the accused be put to his election immediately after the information was read to him implies that the accused must be put to his election at his first appearance. But the question then becomes whether what was said by Mr. Justice Ritchie in the Doyle case is obiter dictum or not. In the case of Locke, which was decided about a year after the Doyle case by Magistrate Luther in Newfoundland, Magistrate Luther held that Mr. Justice Ritchie's remarks were obiter dictum. He held that section 484 only described the sequence of events and not when they were to occur. And he added that to hold strictly to Mr. Justice Ritchie's remarks might abrogate an accused rights under the Bill of Rights, section 2, subsection E, namely the right to a fair hearing in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. It was Magistrate Luther's view that the accused should be put to his election as soon as he was prepared for it and probably no later than his second or third appearance, but in any event within a reasonably short period of time. 
in a subsequent case of Re Aiello and the Queen, A-I-E-L-L-O, decided in 1977 by Mr. Justice Morden of the Supreme Court. He said that the question of whether Mr. Justice Ritchie's remarks were obiter or ratio decidendi need not be decided, holding that assuming such a failure, to put the election of the accused on his first appearance did result in a loss of jurisdiction. It was only loss of jurisdiction over the person and not the information, and consequently, when the accused reappeared in court, jurisdiction was regained. Also, Mr. Justice Morden held that Section 465, subsection 1B, gave the court power to adjourn the inquiry to ensure, amongst other things, that procedural justice was done, and that that would include adjourning to allow the accused to retain counsel to assist him in making an intelligent election choice. Finally, in a case of Regina and Gestelli, again, I'm not going to spell it for you because you'll have it in the paper, also decided in 1977, the British Columbia Court of Appeal was of the view that Doyle did not decide that the accused must be put to his election on the first or any other appearance, and therefore, in their view, the remarks of Mr. Justice Ritchie were over. The court also held that the power to adjourn under Section 465, subsection 1B, existed at the very beginning of the proceedings and in no way depended on the accused having been given his election on his initial appearance. And it would therefore appear that the better view is that the remarks of Mr. Justice Ritchie in the Doyle case were obiter, and there appears to be a consensus that the election need not be put to the accused on his first appearance in the court. Now, I don't know, Mr. Chairman, I uh, had no idea that I could get so enthusiastic about this topic. <laughs> And I'm sure I can go on, but I, I see it's now getting to be approximately 20 to uh, 7, and I'm sure that the subject of preliminary hearings will be much more interesting, and I'm quite happy to opt out now, as they say, or to elect not to proceed further. <laughs> well, the only thing, ladies and gentlemen, I was extremely anxious to discuss with you, which I hadn't uh, really intended to tonight, the, the zip case, the jury case, and the uh, judgment of Mr. Justice Toy, because I felt that, that th those recent decisions really were extremely important. So far as the balance of the matters that I was going to discuss with you are concerned, they are in the paper, and uh, perhaps it's a little easier to take that, this sort of thing at a, uh, at a more leisurely time in the day. But I thank you very much for your attention to really what is a subject which is as dull as dishwater.